Over the past few weeks, we've been tracing the story of the people of God through the Old Testament. We've talked about how in the ancient world, a God went with a people and the people went with the God. In other words, an ethnic group or people who were from a specific nation would be defined by worshiping a certain God or goddess or sometimes a set of gods or goddesses. And in the Bible, we are reading the story of Yahweh, the God who was and is and is to come, and the story of his people, the people of Israel in the Old Testament. In Exodus, we saw that Yahweh chose to be known as the God who is represented by an enslaved people. He chooses an enslaved people as his people. And through his choice of that people, he reveals himself as a rescuer and redeemer of slaves. Now, in the Old Testament, the people of God are primarily the ethnic group Israel. In the ancient world, an ethnicity was mostly defined by the God they worshipped. Now, in the whole Old Testament, that meant that primarily the people of Israel were defined through worshipping Yahweh, although that also involved where they lived, the land, it involved the language they spoke, Hebrew, and what they looked like. We did see this past Sunday that there were times when people who weren't from ethnic Israel became part of the people of God. And as we've been looking through uh, this whole Old Testament story, we've seen there are two main Hebrew words that are used to describe the people of God. The first is the word am, which usually is translated as people. That's a very common word in Hebrew. It happens 140 times in Exodus. And the second is the word goy, which is usually translated as nation. And both of those words are used in Exodus 19, which is one of the key passages for understanding the story of the people of God. We looked at it last week, but I want to read it again before we look at today's passage in the New Testament. Exodus 19.3 Then Moses went up to God, and Yahweh called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the children of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all peoples, that's the word Am, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's the word Goy. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Yahweh tells the people of Israel, this ethnic group, if you keep the terms of my covenant, which is then introduced with the Ten Commandments, if you keep these terms, then out of all ethnic groups, you will be the people, the nation that are mine, that I've chosen, that belong to me. You will be my representatives in the world. You belong with me and I belong with you. You will be my treasured possession. And he says you'll be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation or a set apart or special nation. The kingdom of priests means that the whole nation will be like Adam and Eve, who were meant to be go-betweens between God and the world. So a priest in the ancient world is somebody who represents the God to the people and the people to the God. So the nation of Israel would be a kingdom of priests. The whole group would represent Yahweh to the whole world, both to other humans and to the whole created world. So last week we saw that the whole story of the Old Testament is the story of the people of God. The nation of Israel was supposed to be the kingdom of priests who represented God to the world, who bring his shalom to the world. Now, if you keep this passage in mind, it really helps us to understand the other key passage for our whole series, which is found in 1 Peter 2. We're going to look at 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, which is the center of the theme of the people of God in the New Testament. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. These verses are written to a people that didn't used to be a people. And so we know this is talking to a new group than Moses was speaking to in Exodus 19. In Exodus 19, Yahweh was speaking to the ethnic group of Israel, but we know here in 1 Peter 2 that Peter is writing to a new group that is God's chosen people. So let's look at some of the Greek words that are used throughout the New Testament to talk about ethnicity and people, nation, just like we've been doing with the Hebrew words in the Old Testament, we're going to look at some of the Greek words now that carry these same meanings. So in this passage, we see three of the main ones, and there are two that are the most common, Um, but these words are used throughout the New Testament to talk about our identity as God's people. 
So the first word that's used here is in verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen people. And you might know other translations of this that say you are a chosen race. And the word that's used there is the word genos. And the word genos has to do with common birth or common ancestry usually. Uh, In the Bible, this word usually means nation or people or class or kind. We have a number of English words that come from the word genos, like genetics or gene, um, gynecology, generation, genealogy. All of these words come from that Greek word genos. And those words all have to do with birth and ancestry. So Peter says here, but you, who didn't used to be people, as we'll see in verse 10, you are a chosen common ancestry. You're, you're a people or a race that has a common ancestry, although you didn't used to be a people. So it's not a common ancestry like you might think. When you think about birth in the New Testament, you think about the idea of being born again or born from above. And what that shows us is that the kind of common birth that P- Peter was writing about here is not about your ethnicity or your ancestry, but about our shared birth, our shared new birth, because we belong to Jesus. The second word that's used in this passage that talks about people and ethnicity and nation is the holy nation. You are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And the word that's used there is ethnos. We've looked at this one before. This is the most common word that's used to describe nationality and ethnicity in the New Testament. The word ethnos means nation, people, family, and ethnicity. And in the Old Testament, when they translated it into Greek, ethnos was the main word that would be used to translate the Hebrew word goi. So as we've seen goi in the Old Testament, that means nation. In the New Testament, ethnos usually means nation. And we get the English word ethnicity from this. You, the people of God, are a holy nation. And there's a a word that is there for holy nation. It's the word hagias. And hagias means holy. It also means saints when it's used by itself. In English, our word for holy and our word for saint don't sound very similar, but there are a lot of other languages where the two words sound very similar. Uh, You may have heard of the ancient church, the Hagia Sophia, and there are a number of times where we'll hear Hagia in certain contexts that remind us of ancient church history because it was the idea of the holy or the holy ones. So a lot of times in the New Testament, it will just say the saints. And when we read the saints, it's referring to this corporate group, the people of God. So it doesn't always say the holy people. Sometimes it just says the holy, which can mean the holy ones. Some of our translations will say saints. Some will say the holy people. So you'll see both when you're reading the New Testament. It all ties in with this same idea. So we are a chosen genos, a chosen people or a chosen race. We share this common ancestry through our new birth in Jesus. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. That means that we are a special ethnicity. God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people. And this is the other main word that's used in the New Testament. This is the word laos. Laos means people. And when you're looking at the Greek translation of the Old Testament, laos is the main word that's used to translate the Hebrew word am, which means people or family or nation or ethnicity. So it carries all of that as well. So then we've looked at some of the words here. We've looked at genos, ethnos, and laos. And they all have this idea of ethnicity and nation. That's not really the way we think about ethnicity today. We have nations that are multi-ethnic, and so we don't think of nation and ethnicity as being overlapping terms, but they were to ancient people because they thought more that way. And an ethnicity, as I've said before, is essentially a family that's gotten so big that you don't know all your six cousins anymore, but you all, you all have a common ancestor. And so Peter's point here is that we didn't used to be a people. We didn't used to be an ethnicity. We didn't all come from the same family, but now we do. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. The whole point of 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 is that the people of God is not defined through common human ancestry. We don't have the same ethnic heritage, but we are the people of God. We've been talking about how the God goes with the people and the people goes with the God. So Jesus, the God who is revealed in the New Testament, chooses to be represented by a multi-ethnic ethnicity, by a multinational nation, a people that is made up of many backgrounds. And that is the defining characteristic of who he is. 
the God goes with the people and the people goes with the God. And we've seen that in the ancient world. We've seen that in the story of the Old Testament. And now we see that in the story of the New Testament. Peter uses the same language here as was used in Exodus 19. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, God's special possession. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel were called all those things. And now in the New Testament, there's this new group, this multi-ethnic group that is called all of those things, that reveals the God of the Bible. Now, when we read about these ideas, some Bible commentators, some Bible scholars end up taking a very individualistic approach to this passage. So I've read some Bible scholars who say that each of us individually should say, wow, I am chosen. This is a pretty big idea in Christian theology. Well, I individually was chosen by God. But if we take off our Western individualistic lenses and put on the lens of the people of God and we understand the way that ancient people thought and people from the cultures of the Bible thought, and we start to embrace this phrase, the people of God, when we read this passage, it's very plain to see that what Peter's talking about is not that you as an individual are a chosen member of of God's people or that you are one of the people of God. No, it's talking about how God has chosen this ethnic group, this people group. And that ethnic or people group that he's chosen is made up of people from every ethnicity, from every nation. When we enter into this people of God mindset, it's plain to see that what Peter's talking about is God choosing this whole people to be his representatives. God has elected or chosen a diverse people to represent him. Just as God chose enslaved people in the Old Testament to represent him, he chose people who were enslaved to Egypt. In the same way, in the New Testament, God has chosen people who were enslaved to sin to represent him. He has chosen a people who are on the outside. In Egypt, he chose people who were on the outside of society, the Israelites. And in the New Testament, he's choosing people who are persecuted by the Roman Empire. As people began to follow Jesus, they would be persecuted. And just like the people of Israel were under the thumb of Egyptian oppression, the followers of Jesus in the New Testament were under the thumb of Roman oppression. The people of God will always be outsiders when they refuse to give their allegiance to the kingdoms of the world, but choose to give it to the God who was and is and will be. Now, when we look at verse 9, you see that in most of our translations, it starts with the word but. So this verse, these verses are written to contrast something that Peter has just said. So we need to back up and read the first part of Peter's logic here to understand what he's talking about. So let's look at verse four. Peter writes, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel are often called the house of Israel. And the idea that they as, as, a, as a nation were priests meant that they had priests within them who offered sacrifices, but they were called to be those who represented the whole world to God. So there's a lot of priestly language that's used here in this text, uh, and it's referring to the house or the spiritual house. In the Old Testament, that's talking about Israel. Here it's talking about anyone who comes to Jesus as being the spiritual house who offers sacrifices, who becomes a priest. For in the scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. In the Old Testament, there are two passages in Isaiah and one in the Psalms that are quoted here. And those passages all talk about how the cornerstone that God will build his, his house upon will be rejected by Israel and Judah. So the people of God, the Old Testament people of God, will reject what God wants to do, the foundation for what he wants to do. But... God is using that rejected cornerstone as the foundation for what he wants to do moving forward. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. 
Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So this is not talking about God tearing down his old people and building a new people. What it's talking about is God taking something from his people, which is Jesus. Jesus is an ethnic Israelite. And the people of Israel that had been the people of God reject this stone. But God says, no, this is truly the stone I want to use. This is the best stone from the people of Israel. This is what I want to use to build my people on. And so the the house that is the people of God is built on this foundation. So there's a continuity between the Old Testament people of God and the New Testament people of God. But it's not exactly the same because the people who made up the people of God in the Old Testament didn't agree with what God was doing in building his house. This is a very nuanced uh, distinction, but it can become more important as we talk about things like anti-Semitism and how we think about the differences and similarities, the overlaps, the separation between Judaism and Christianity. Now, one really interesting thing about this passage is that this is not the only thing from the time period that sought to deal with the concept of the cornerstone. Isaiah and the Psalms were written centuries before Peter wrote his letter here. But just a few decades or a couple centuries maybe before Peter wrote, there was a group of Jews who wanted to understand this idea of the cornerstone, who were thinking through it as well. In the mid-20th century, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. There were some caves that were found out in the desert in southern Israel. And inside those caves, there were jars. And in the jars, there were scrolls. And you may have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They really changed a lot about what we, how we understand the Bible, because these were really ancient copies of a lot of the Old Testament. There weren't just copies of the Old Testament, though. There were also other scrolls that were written by the people who lived in, the, in this area. It's called Qumran. So we talk about the Qumran community. They lived out in the desert. And this was a group of people who really were committed to being pure religiously. They were Jewish people who thought our society isn't following Yahweh. They're not following the God that we've read about, the God that we worship. And our land is being overrun and occupied by foreign countries over the past hundreds of years. And maybe the reason that that's happened is because we haven't committed ourselves to God completely. So this group of people goes out into the desert and they establish a commune, essentially. This is kind of like uh, really extreme cults are today, although they didn't really, uh, we don't really know that they did anything dangerous there, uh, but they were very committed to being ideologically pure. So another way of thinking it, instead of thinking of a cult, would be to think of uh, a, a monastery, this group of people who go out and, and seek spiritual purity. One of the scrolls that, that was discovered is called 1QS. That means it was in the first cave of Qumran, and it's the S scroll. This is called the Rule of the Community. And I want to read the first bit of this scroll to you that was discovered in the mid-20th century. This was written sometime uh, one to two centuries before Jesus. And this is, this is how these people interpreted the concept of the cornerstone. In the community council, there shall be 12 men and three priests, perfect in everything that has been revealed from all the law to implement truth, justice, judgment, compassionate love, and unassuming behavior of one to another, to preserve faithfulness in the land with firm purpose and a repentant spirit in order to atone for sin by doing justice and undergoing trials, and to walk with everyone in the measure of the truth and the regulation of the time. When these things exist in Israel, the community council shall be founded on truth, and then there's a section that's missing, to be an everlasting plantation, a holy house for Israel, and the foundation of the holy of holies for Aaron, true witnesses for the judgment and chosen by the will of God to atone for the land and to render the wicked their retribution. There's another section missing. This, the community most likely, is the tested rampart, the precious cornerstone that does not and there's some more missing from the scroll, whose foundations shake or tremble from their place. More missing from the scroll. It will be the most holy dwelling for Aaron with eternal knowledge of the covenant of justice and in order to offer a pleasant aroma 
and it will be a house of perfection and truth in Israel. I know these are flowery words that are used to translate an ancient document, so let's look at what this means. This group of religious people had gone out into the desert because they believed that the nation of Israel was not being the way it was meant to be. They were not being a holy nation. They weren't setting themselves apart from the other ethnic groups, and they were just sort of fitting in with the rest of the world. So this group, the Qumran community, went off into the desert. They removed themselves. It was kind of like the Amish, actually. That might be a good comparison in our country. And they went off into the desert, separating themselves, and they, they established a leadership council of 12 men and three priests. And they viewed this leadership group of 15 to be the foundation for the spiritual house of Israel, the foundation for the priesthood. They even used the word cornerstone. The Qumran community were the ultimate insiders. They were part of the chosen people of God, the Jews, but then within that group, they separated themselves and said, we are really going to be loyal to the way of Yahweh. We are going to be committed to him. We're going to follow the Old Testament laws. These were people who were extremely conservative religiously and politically, who said, we're going to be so dedicated to the scripture and what it means and following the scripture. And we believe that if we do this, then we will be the foundation for the rule of God. He will come and bless his house once more. In contrast, in 1 Peter 2, we see that the election or choosing is not found upon our ideological purity or removing ourselves from the world. The followers of Jesus say that to be chosen or elect is not defined by our ethnic heritage or by where you were born, by what language you speak or what God or goddess you used to worship. The cornerstone is not our commitment to a conservative view of scripture. The Qumran community said our cornerstone is partly built on a conservative interpretation of scripture. Peter doesn't say that. The cornerstone is Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone. It says in verse 4, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans. So most humans choose to reject Jesus because his way of humanity is so different from the way that we all want to live, looking out for ourselves. So most of us, most humans, reject Jesus. But we are invited to come to him, and many of us do come to him. And as we do so, we come to the chosen one. It talks about him being a chosen one, chosen by God in verse 4. And then down in verse 9, we are the chosen people. So we become part of the chosen people by coming to the chosen one. He is the cornerstone, and we become living stones built into this house. Now, it's great to become a living stone, to become part of the house. And it's great to think of our individual salvation. I'm so thankful that I am a living stone, and I, I hope you're thankful that you are a living stone, that you individually can come and be a part of what God is doing, that you can be forgiven, that you can be built on top of Jesus. But it's only so great to be a stone. It's really great to be part of the house. A stone is okay, but the house is amazing. So Peter, in his imagery here, is pointing, that, pointing out that our main thing to be excited about is that we're part of the people of God. Now, if we strip away the ethnic layers of this, and we just talk about people who are coming from the same ethnic group, this is still really amazing and beautiful and powerful news that no matter what you've done, no matter what you've experienced, if you come to Jesus, you can become a living stone and you can be part of his house. But when we read this passage in context and we see where Peter is headed in verses 9 and 10, we see that the culmination of this whole argument, this whole statement, is that Jesus is building a multi-ethnic ethnicity. His house is made up of people from many places. It's like he's taking stones from all kinds of different quarries. He's using granite and marble and quartz and whatever to build his house. And we are this multi-colored, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multinational house that is where the Spirit of God dwells. When we think about the individual and corporate levels of this passage, we can start with the individual level and then move to the corporate level. So Peter first says at the beginning, as you come to him, the living stone. So each of us is invited to come to Jesus. And 
we are invited to be in his presence, to follow him, and all of those things. And then in verse 7, now to you who believe, and this is the word that we've been talking about all year, the word pistis, the word faith, or to have belief. We are called not just to believe intellectually, but to give our allegiance to Jesus. As we individually give our allegiance to Jesus, then we become living stones. And then we are built into a house, and that's the corporate idea here. We together are what this passage is all pointing towards, our corporate identity as the people of God. And it is our corporate identity as the people of God that is the house where God dwells, the temple, and we become corporately together, we become the priesthood where we represent who Jesus is to everyone around us. Your identity individually is you are where God lives and you are a priest, but the bigger idea here, the more important idea in this passage is that together we are the chosen. We are the place where God dwells. We are the representatives of God in the world. The God goes with the people and the people goes with the God. Next week, we'll look at how Peter continues on. He instructs us on how to live in a country. As those who are the people of God, how do we live in the most powerful nation on earth? That's a question that we can ask in 2020 in the U.S., but it's also a question that the followers of Jesus could ask in the Roman Empire. And so Peter answers that question in the next few verses. If we've given our allegiance to Jesus, that's what it means to believe in him, then how do we live in a country that demands our allegiance? How do we interact with our political leaders, with those who have political power? How do we live in the face of injustice? Peter deals with those questions in the rest of chapter 2. The answer is not to become like the Qumran community and separate ourselves. There are many religious people in the ancient world and presently who think that the answer is to separate ourselves from society, to become ideologically pure, to become so committed to a conservative reading of the text that we could find our cornerstone there. And if we're just committed enough, then God will heal us and bless us. But that's not the answer that Peter is going to give us in the rest of the chapter. And that makes sense because Peter doesn't see what we do as our cornerstone. Peter sees Jesus as our cornerstone. Religious people have a tendency to become like the Qumran community. We think that if we just buckle down enough, we can invite God's favor. And if we separate ourselves from the world enough, it will be better. If we become pure enough, it will be better. But Peter says our foundation isn't our ideological purity or our separation from culture. We don't determine who is elect by drawing smaller and smaller circles. Instead, we allow Jesus, the chosen one, to draw all people to himself. He is our cornerstone, and we are his people being built into his house. Let's remember that we are the people of God. Once we were not a people, but now we are the people of God.